Okay, applications of radioactive isotopes, lecture 60. Describe what a, radio tra a radioactive tracer is and what it can be used for. And lots of different things that it can be used for, but a radioactive tracer is giving off radiation all the time. So if we put it into a chemical system, we can study its movement in a chemical system. We can study where it is as part of a reaction. If it's a, a very complex reaction with several steps, we can stop a reaction midway in a, in a lot of different ways and then just study where that isotope is as part of a reaction. Um, the study of photosynthesis is really a very complex reaction and if you put in a say a carbon-14 uh, a, a lot of carbon-14 into the process uh, more than you'd see naturally you can uh, take the reaction as it's going along stop it uh, analyze the molecules that contain the carbon-14. So if the carbon-14 came in as, as this, and then later on you see it as part of a molecule, you know that that's somehow the CO2 was converted by the plant into that molecule. So it's that kind of thing that allows us uh, to study very complex mechanisms. But a very simple one here is one that we've, we just have, uh, we always assumed it has been true, with this equilibrium, here's lead iodide, lead 2 iodide, we, we assumed that there was an equilibrium between the lead and the, and the ions that go into the solution. So then we have a beaker of water and then we have the lead iodide on the bottom, I have it here, that when the lead leaves, you know, we, we know that some of it dissolves. That's something that we can measure. But we're assuming that by this equilibrium that this, these guys come back. This lead comes back in here and so an, another lead leaves. The iodide comes back and leaves. Uh, rather than it just being out there, you know, going into the solution and then, then staying out there, the, the lead and the iodide come back over and over and over again, become solid, then go back to aqueous. Well, that's a, an assumption that's very hard to prove with something that is very, very slightly... Uh, soluble. So what we do is we put sodium iodide 131 into the solution. Very reactive. It's used for medical purposes too. Medical trace, uh, uh, tracers, radioactive tracers that go into the, the body. But uh, the, the iodide 131 now is radioactive. So we let it, we put that stuff in into the solution. We just let it sit there uh, for however long, hours or days or months or whatever they found in this case to, to uh, allow a lot of the iodide to become part of the, the solid, then the solid should be made up of, uh, let's see how many things, so we have the lead iodide, but it should also be made up of lead iodide with the iodine-131 in it, and it should also contain something uh, it should also contain formula units that are two iodides per lead. But these ones will be radioactive. So what they do after they've let it sit for a long time, they, they pour off the, the top of the, the, the solution. They take the solid, they wash it, dry it out, and then study its, its radioactivity. <coughs> now, the... Uh, hold on a second. And they find that the iodide is, is right in there. So that's right inside the bulk. So it proves that there is an equilibrium, that it doesn't just uh, break up into the ions and, and then that's it. It does flow back and become a solid again. <clears throat> so describe what isotope dilution is and what it can be used for. So back in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, 1930s in the western part of the country we had the dust bowl there's uh, people over farmed and they didn't replace the the soil the nutrients in the soil and and the, all the topsoil of the and huge um, uh, areas of the the western part of the country just turned into dust and 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 blew away and whole towns were were just eradicated because of it. People had to move away. Well, there's many, many um, hundreds of reservoirs uh, for gas tanks, for gas, um, for gas stations that were just left that contained a certain, you know, a lot of gasoline and 
when they dig them up, they're trying to get rid of them. Uh, they, they've been, uh, I, I don't know where they are in the process. This is a long time ago that I heard about this, but they were looking for, uh, they, they would find them and they'd want to find out how big these reservoirs are because they were all different sizes. So this would be where you could use isotope dilution. So this thing contains uh, your uh, gasoline, a lot of water, I'm sure, at that point. And, but they don't know how large it is. So if you take a one liter, of a radioactive uh, substance and it's giving off a certain amount of radiation so it has a certain uh, it has a certain activity and you pour it into the into the underground reservoir and this can be done with natural reservoirs as well. We dump it in there, let it mix around for a while, and you draw it back out. Let's say the activity has been cut to, um, say, one one hundred thousandth. Then, then you know that the the volume of this container is one hundred thousand liters. Assuming that the radioactive substance has a very long half-life. So isotope dilution is used to determine the size of a system without actually having to go in and measure it. You just put the the solution in, you know how act, what its activity is, allow it to go through the whole solution, then take a small fraction of that uh, of that system and if the activity has been has dropped by 10 times then the system is 10 times larger than your original sample. So that can be very useful for systems like, um, not only for something like this, these gas tanks, but if you have underground re reservoirs or underground uh, uh, oil systems, I, I don't know, I doubt that they use it for that. I'm sure they have more sophisticated methods, but if you have an underground reservoir of water and you want to know how large that it is, you uh, can put in an, a radioactive isotope that say has a half-life of billions of years uh, and is easily measured. Throw that in there. Give it, you know, six months to go through the to to even itself out to to uh, even out that concentration of it through the whole reservoir, and you can get a, a good idea of how large that reservoir is. Okay, describe what a neutron activation analysis is and what it can be used for. Now, if you take something that is this is a uh, non-radioactive and you slam it with a very high energy neutron you can create a an unstable or metastable element then that metastable element is going to decay into um, into a uh, stable form of the element with a higher um, Make sure that that's the case here. Yeah, into a. I don't think I have the right. Uh, did I get the right one? Just to make sure I have the right element before I go any further. Yeah, uh, into the. Uh, it'll decay into a stable state and give off a a uh, gamma particle, and this one. Uh, different frequencies. For different elements. So a lot of elements will will react to this uh, neutron activation analysis and will and will give off different forms of gamma uh, photons and once you see that uh, very specific gamma photon that's a fingerprint for the uh, the element that's present. So if you want to know if there's uh, arsenic present in a, a certain substance um, say in human hair of somebody who may or may not have been poisoned with a very low concentration of arsenic, this would be a way of determining it that would be very, very precise. So you should be able to just give one of these examples. There's other ones in the books just uh, of neutron activation analysis, isotope dilution, and radioactive tracers.